Morning, everyone. It's 11 a.m. and thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Carlos Ivan Lopez. I'm a vice president of the Venezuelan American Association of the United States. I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining uh, our conversation today with Jose Cárdenas and Vanessa Neumann on recent events affecting Venezuela. Today's subject is Who is Alex Saab? Is he Maduro's worst nightmare? Heartfelt thanks to Mr. Cárdenas and Dr. Neumann for taking the time to be with us today and sharing their views on the subject. And to our vice president, Ambassador Michael Skoll, thanks, Michael, who will introduce them and guide the discussion as a moderator. The Venezuela and America Association vows has been promoting exchange between Venezuela and the United States for over 85 years. During this unprecedented crisis, vows has been diligent in fostering discussion to spark action. We thank you all for accompanying us on our quest for knowledge and for a better future for Venezuela. Now, I would like to introduce you to our moderator. Michael Skoll was U.S. Ambassador to Venezuela from 1999, 1990 to 1993. Besides Caracas, his other foreign service postings were Buenos Aires, Saigon, Santo Domingo, Naples, Rome, San Jose, Bogota, and Washington, D.C. Since his retirement from the State Department, uh, Ambassador Skoll has pursued a second career in anti-corruption, counter-money laundering, and risk management services. He is a principal of binational U.S. Colombian Consortium, Skoll and Cernan. During today's chat, uh, we'll, Michael will make an introduction and then we'll uh, give some space for Jose and Vanessa to share their views on the subject. And of course, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Please feel free to send your uh, questions in, on the uh, Q&A uh, chat uh, uh, application in, in, in the sub application so we can answer it at the end. And now I turn the program to you, uh, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, he will introduce our panelists briefly. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. And now to uh, Alex Saab. This is an extraordinary story of, um, well, criminal activity on behalf of a criminal state, money laundering, theft, drug trafficking, illicit enrichment, fictitious exports and imports. I've got a whole list here of uh, things he's done. It includes the sale of adulterated milk, milk powder for poor Venezuelans, tens of billions of dollars. Um, he's been investigated, indicted by countries from the U.S. and Colombia to Liechtenstein. I don't know how that happened. And Switzerland. Uh, frankly, he makes Tony Soprano look like uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, <laughs> and the, the other half of the story of, uh, is what the reaction of the Maduro regime has been um, uh, to his extradition to the U.S. in October. That's another very significant uh, story. Uh, to talk about Saab and what he represents, we have two distinguished experts, um, neither one of whom is shy about telling things <laughs> as they are. Um, Jose Cardenas is a consultant with many years of experience in, uh, in the Washington State Department, NSC, uh, USA, the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He produces the da daily Venezuela sit rep. This is a really valuable daily email report on what is going on in that country. I would get on that list if you want to know right away what, um, what's happening without, uh, without um, uh, hesitation. Uh, Vanessa Neumann uh, is an <laughs> author, a diplomat, a security expert. She's president and founder of the anti-corruption and anti-trafficking consultancy Asymmetrica. In other words, she's a competitor with uh, Skoll and Serena, but we do cooperate. <laughs> uh, Dr. Neumann wrote Blood Profits, How American Consumers Unwittingly Fund Terrorist 2017. Here, hey. I, can't I can't show you my Kindle version because I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Uh, <laughs> from March 2019 through November 2020, she served as the Venezuelan interim government's that's Guaido, official representative to the United Kingdom and, um, and, uh, and uh, Ireland. A reminder, if you want to ask a question, uh, click the Q&A button at the bottom. Write your question or comment. We'll get to as many as we can. Okay, Vanessa, who or what is Alex Saab? Well, thank you for having me on, and I'll never compete with you. I can only aspire to your to to your career, Michael. But uh, think of us as a mutual, mutually reinforcing. Um, and thank you. You must also subscribe to uh, Jose Cardenas Sitrep. I want to say 
It's one of the first things I read every morning. That, the Financial Times and The Economist and Jose Cardenas' has email. <laughs> um, <laughs> true, true story, true story, as the kids say. Um, anyway, who is Alex Saab? Alex Saab is what I like to call, he's a hyper-connector that connects the criminal, the, tra- the criminal organization of the Maduro regime into all of these other proxies that are of interest that are now involved in helping sustain it. He's a kind of a rare breed uh, in that he, people like him are replaceable, but not easily replaceable because he has a sort of massive Rolodex that enables him to connect you know, uh, Colombian, uh, uh, Colombian uh, uh, corrupt uh, politicians, uh, Colombian uh, cartels, to the Venezuelan military, to uh, you know, offshore banking structures, which would be where Liechtenstein would have come in, um, to Mexican and uh, uh, to Mexican shell companies and corruption over there that enable this. Um, and also to Iran, Iran, Russia, Turkey, and everything else, for these um, and and uh, that are uh, that are helping prop this up. So what's important about him is that usually that's what makes Maduro so difficult to dislodge, and why 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 Saab is so protected by Maduro. It's not simply Maduro who's protecting Saab. It will also be the Russians and the Iranians who are advising Maduro on how to protect Saab. So in this case, Maduro is sort of the mouthpiece uh, to defend Saab because he's defending so many other interests. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about him is he's sort of a Mexican guy who came along, I think making originally keychains or, you know, sort of like little, little, uh, you know, merch, uh, uh, you know, almost like you would get at a rock concert and ended up uh, you know, and ended up being someone who provided uh, construction materials for these Mission Vivienda uh, of, of, um, of, of, of Chavez, really, started under Chavez. And with over-invoicing, provided the mechanism for his own enrichment, for the enrichment of the corrupt actors within the Chavez regime of the Chavistas, but also through that over invoicing provided also a mechanism for money laundering of the drug trafficking that was happening. So one of the things that happens that has happened in Venezuela, the main thing that has happened aside from the incompetence and the kleptocracy has been that they have used these these invoicing structures um, and things that are supposed to be charitable causes like Mission Vivienda, the CLAP food program, um, as mechanisms for different slices being paid to all the supporters and the network that help keep Maduro in power, and also to launder the money of drug cartels or Iran or Russian oligarchs or whatever whatever it is, whoever needs their money laundered, uh, who are the friends of the Chavistas. So that you get these la- multi-layering of purposes in these and for the Chavistas, crises such as starvation, okay, are an opportunity for money making for all these guys. So they get it, they then devise a so-called solution and a plan to import food that the main concern is not really to feed Venezuelans who still continue to starve and will starve even more if they dare speak their mind and vote against Chavismo, right? They won't get their boxes clapped. And they've said that even in the November 21st election. Uh, So that the form of the, uh, uh, Alex Saab is one of the main players that enabled all of these schemes that monetize and enriched the Chavistas and their cronies, including drug traffickers to profit from the suffering of the Venezuelan people. And the more the Venezuelan people suffered, the more money everybody made. And so what happens is that the Venezuelan people end up out of desperation, having to continue to support the people who benefit from their suffering 
and to support, in effect, their own torturers. Alexa knows all of this. He is not some naive puppet. He is a massive architect of the mechanisms that expand these programs that deepen the suffering of the Venezuelan people, the enrichment of the nefarious Chavista actors and their international partners. Taking him out of the equation uh, presents an opportunity for intelligence gathering and understanding where the money is. And even if the money has been moved around, which I can presume it has, um, you know, what the mechanisms are and who those players would be. Uh, that presents an opportunity to, uh, from an intelligence and law enforcement standpoint, to find out who else we need to get and to, as law enforcement likes to say, shake the tree and see what else falls out. I'll leave it at that. I'll let Jose uh, speak further and I'd rather just leave it open for further questions and address your questions then. Thank you. Very good, uh, Vanessa, thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's turn to uh, Jose uh, right now. Uh, uh, why does he drive uh, Nicolas Maduro crazy? I mean, I've watched a lot of uh, extraditions and indictments around the world and I've never seen quite the reaction that the Maduro regime uh, has, uh, has, has done uh, in reaction to the, uh, the, the extradition of, of Alex Saab to the US. What the, why? Well, thank you, Michael. And first of all, let me let me just uh, thank you and the association for this opportunity. It's great to see and be here with Vanessa. Um, and uh, I want to compliment uh, Vanessa for her uh, her opening uh, remarks that uh, give you a good indication of what exactly this fellow was up to. Um, I wanted to make three points. Uh, in response to your query, uh, Mike, um, and then uh, obviously we can go to, to questions and answers. Um, you know, I want to pick up on Vanessa's point about the sheer callousness of this regime, and uh, I, I agree totally that they see opportunity and suffering and a, a ability to make more money. It's very interesting um, because, uh, you know, many people are wondering where all this is going. Why, you know, are we just playing whack-a-mole? In other words, every time a two-bit criminal uh, pops their head up, they get smacked down and, you know, it's an endless game. Um, and I, I wanna say that I, I don't agree with that. I think that all of this um, has very important ramifications uh, for the regime and the future of Venezuela. One of the things about the callousness is that um, people, uh, folks in the State Department that I speak to, uh, who are close to the, uh, watching closely the negotiation process that was suspended by Maduro, the one that's ongoing in Mexico, they told me that uh, it's very interesting that what is the most, what is consuming the Maduro representatives and the Maduro regime in this effort to uh, uh, engage with the opposition is getting individual sanctions lifted. Mm. In other words, they don't care about the sectoral sanctions. They don't care about oil or other uh, uh, products that can generate money for the country to use to help the people. They care about their own skins. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it is in, you know, again, it just highlights the utter callousness of this regime, that uh, that they that just engaging with the opposition is only a way to save themselves, um, rather than bringing any relief to the Venezuelan people. Um, another point uh, I wanted to uh, pick up on that Vanessa made is that yes, uh, Saab is uh, replaceable. It's not easy, but and uh, and what is going on here? is that uh, he's replaceable, but this is a position that entails a high tolerance for risk mm -hmm. uh, because of the, uh, the precincts, the, the, the people and the networks that these people are operating in, not to mention, uh, you know, these are very 
dangerous uh, uh, characters involved in, in the narco money. And, I mean, these are mafias. Um, and, and so what by, by making an example of Saab, what the US is doing, it's driving up the risk fast factor but for anybody who wants to step into the breach, uh, look at, you know, his life has been utterly destroyed and he is now uh, getting the finest attention of the US judiciary uh, system who knows how to make somebody's life utterly uh, uh, catastrophic. So uh, Maduro is basically preoccupied by the fact that with Saab taken off the playing field, the, their ability to find somebody to replace them just got a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. And then the third point I wanted to make about this uh, effort by the United States and other uh, cooperating law enforcement agencies in identifying uh, the breadth of this network that Vanessa talked about in various countries and also the Venezuelan individuals who are making the choice to get involved in international criminal activity is that when they are exposed through these efforts, whether through sanctions, whether through indictments by the United States and others, is basically to put a mark of Cain on them. In other words, so in effect, disqualifying them from any future role in hope, what we all are aspiring to, and that is a return to a constitution, uh, an institutional democratic government in Venezuela. We know that, and Mike, you've seen this uh, in your career, how people have a, a, a quite an amazing ability to reinvent themselves uh, <laughs> after the stuff hits the fan once. And you know, we saw it when the Berlin Wall fell. You know, how many of the former Communist Party members in the Soviet Union and the other countries all of a sudden were wanted to participate in democratic politics uh, as small D Democrats? What, what, what is happening now in this process is that these people are being identified, Venezuelans, mm -hmm. who made a choice to either uh, remain uh, within a legal democratic framework or to cross that line into inter international criminal activity. And if you cross that line, you are signing away your future in Venezuela as any kind of participant in a post Maduro government. Now, we can all, we can, and we will, I'm sure, discuss when do we uh, reach a post-Maduro government. But I think it's important now to put that into, into Venezuelans' minds. Anybody who is thinking of becoming another cog in the Maduro criminal, criminal enterprise, they ought to think about that. Do they mm -hmm. want to sign over their future uh, and wind up in, a, in, a, in an orange jumpsuit in the United States or else on a, on, a, on a watch list of the United States where they cannot ever remove that stain. So that is kind of how I see uh, you know, why it matters, why Maduro is uh, so exercised by mm -hmm. the detention, the arrest of Saab and what he is going, no doubt, what he is going to tell U.S. authorities mm -hmm. about his networks, because this guy will cough up everything in order, you know, he does not want to spend his the rest of his life in a maximum security prison uh, in Colorado or, or wherever. Uh, he is going to sing like a canary, and uh, the more names that he he gives up, uh, I think it is it is going to create a tremendous amount of pressure on the Maduro regime. We've got to clean up this cesspool. And uh, the more we can do that through these indictments and these exposures, I think benefits a future Venezuela. Very good. Uh, Vanessa, you have any comment on what uh, Jose just said? 
No, I agree. I agree. And, uh, you know, uh, let me make one additional comment, you know, based on my experiences, the former the former ambassador to the UK for Guaido, uh, if there was one sort of mild regret that I have about sort of the broader strategy toward uh, the democratization of Venezuela is that uh, the narco terrorist indictments against Maduro, which we knew that they were sitting on ever since Project Cassandra, should have been more should have been more heightened and should have been brought out and unsealed not 18 months into the Guaido administration, but immediately when Guaido was recognized. Because I think that what, what one of the things that's important is that, and it, it's actually one of the declared objectives of the Maduro team is to be to get back their full diplomatic recognition. They want to be recognized as the legitimate, uh, you know, de facto and de jure government of, of, uh, of Venezuela. I know because I've read the briefs before the UK Supreme Court, it's written in there. It is also one of their stated objectives uh, in, the, in the Mexico negotiations. Everybody recognize us so that we can get access to all the international reserves that have been frozen from, from London to the United States and a few other countries as well. So I bring this up because having lived this in carne propia, uh, you know, uh, 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 since Guaido's appointment in, in 2019, is <coughs> uh, what Alex Saab has to reveal will also further uh, put paid to that concept that these guys are a government. They don't govern. They're not motivated by running a country. They don't care if people starve. They don't care whether water runs, whether medicine reaches the people, or whether there's security. They are a criminal organization motivated by their own profit. And the more that that can be highlighted to the international community, the less we can get into these ridiculous conversations of, oh, well, Maduro, you know, has some has some sort of legitimacy. Oh, yeah, and let's give him all the money he wants access to. Because let me repeat, the money's not as Jose Cardenas has also just said, you know, they will, the money does not go to benefit the people. They're not worried about the sectoral sanctions. They want to be able to go shopping in Harrods and buy their homes in Miami and go on holiday in Paris. That's what they're after. So increasingly, so what Alex Saab, the horror show of the money laundering, drug trafficking, um, uh, that, that Alex Saab would have to reveal would further highlight and embarrass, uh, you know, uh, further highlight that criminality and basically embarrass anybody who thinks that they should, uh, you know, accept the Maduro regime as some sort of a, uh, a governing body. Because what he has to say will show that they don't govern. Yeah, I, I have to agree 100%. But um, let's take a little longer view of this. We've used the word uh, nightmare to describe uh, what we think um, uh, Maduro is thinking right now. But uh, let's let's look uh, during the uh, the uh, the day. Uh, is the uh, Alex Saab affair going to eventually result in a change in the a good change in the government of Venezuela? I hope so. I think it is one of, and I, I'd like to hear Jose's views on this as well, um, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll just speak briefly. I think, uh, I hope so. I think it is actually one of the best hopes uh, for change to build that pressure of, you know, further, uh, further indictments, further erosion of recognition, uh, further uh, accept, you know, acceptance that this is a criminality and, and, and to build that pressure for it to fracture, right? That people will start tattling on each other and that will provide the basis for perhaps extraterritorial um, yeah, arrests. And what's amazing to me is actually the narco-terrorist indictments that were finally unsealed actually provide for extraterritoriality. That's, that's in the nature, that's in the legislation behind narco-terrorist indictments. Uh, they have not yet acted on that, which is, you know, a question. But I think it does present a very good opportunity. And frankly, it's one of the best opportunities because unfortunately, we see that the Venezuelan opposition and the coalition around Guaido is very weak. 
Uh, Maduro has, unfortunately, I don't like to say this, but I have to be realistic as an analyst, has strengthened his hand over the last few years. Um, and, you know, we've shown that the EU backed electoral uh, process is not going to lead anywhere. I mean, you know, they're already going to have a, a re-election in one of the few states where the where the where the opposition kind of won um, by some unheard of miracle. They're already going to do in Barinas. They're going to do a re-election, and then Manuel Rosales of Un Nuevo Tiempo basically just turned up at Miraflores and genuflected and said, "I'm going to work with you, President Maduro." Wait a minute! I thought you were part of the G4 coalition. So showing that the electoral th scheme isn't going to work, um, that the negotiations are complicated, um, and, um, and, and that time is ticking as Venezuelans are suffering and flooding the rest of the world. We've already lost 20% of our population. Um, the Alex Saab and the criminal charges also with uh, the extradition of El Pollo Carvajal present a very good opportunity, and perhaps right now, one of the best opportunities to pressure for the democratization of Venezuela. And I'd like to hear Jose, what he has to yeah, Jose, are you, are you um, uh, as optimistic or semi-optimistic as Vanessa is about a future change in, um, in, uh, in, in Venezuela? Or is this, is this series uh, going to go on for many, many, many seasons, longer than the Sopranos, I think? <laughs> well, I, you know, uh, to the, I think Vanessa makes a great point about the the international credibility. I, I think that um, the uh, the Saab affair and the the forthcoming revelations we're going to hear from uh, Carvajal and and others um, is going to have its big, biggest impact in foreign capitals. Um, you know, unfortunately, sadly, the Venezuelan people uh, day is so consumed with uh, uh, you know getting through. Uh, the day and, and acquiring basic uh, supplies of life, uh, they don't have much time to think about criminal networks and mafias and around the world and, and what the regime is doing uh, to sustain itself. Um, but I, I do think it does definitely have an impact in these polite societies in Europe. Um, they don't, you know, they, they're, they are, uh, they're going to recoil um, from the, uh, the types of uh, the details that I, asked, I, I think we're going to hear as far as the corrupt, uh, the corruption in the international sphere, and it's mm -hmm. going to be less likely for any government in Europe, and it's going to put more pressure on Spain to carry Maduro's water uh, in the EU. Now, to your broader question, Mike, um, you know, I, I wish I could be more optimistic. I think that. Um, that obviously that Maduro is in the driver's seat right now. I think that uh, ironically, uh, the Barinas election uh, may provide a spark uh, to, to the opposition if they can, you know, look, it's, you know, look, I get it. It's, uh, it's limited. Um, it's in a, a state uh, uh, away from uh, Caracas, obviously. But uh, it, it, if it can galvanize and mobilize the opposition um, into uh, you know, a, a more uh, effective fighting force, if you will, then uh, I'm all for it. I think that, that you know, uh, I, I, with all of the precautions and caveats about the rigged election, the control of the regime, which is indisputable, um, I think that you know the options before the opposition are few, and one of them is to uh, reestablish a ground game, as Vanessa alluded, alluded to, and that is a you know sadly a, a, a long slog uh, ground game uh, through uh, reconnecting with the Venezuelan people and really trying to 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 retake territory inch by inch. This is you know, a, going to be a, you know, a trench warfare, uh, a la World War I uh, with the regime. And um, with all of the odds stacked against the opposition in terms of the legal system, in terms of uh, denial of uh, media, repression, harassment, uh, I, I see few options, but for the opposition to continue, you know, we know that the, the nature of the international community is to lose interest and, uh, and, you know, quote unquote, give up. 
but the opposition can't give up. And, and they've got to, again, uh, engage in really what is going to be a long war of attrition with, uh, with Chavismo to regain ground. Um, you know, and I know that a lot of people won't want to hear that, uh, but to me, when I, when I look across the, again, as, at the range of options that I see available to the opposition at this point, uh, it, it's not a very uh, uh, beneficial position to be in. Uh, Vanessa mentioned the, um, the EU election observers, and I know she has an opinion on this. The, uh, there are, <laughs> there are, uh, uh, people talk about other challenges to the, uh, to the Maduro regime, the, the uh, EU election observer team, um, recent visit, the International Criminal Court. Um, Vanessa, Jose, what do you think about, are they, are they real challenges to, um, to, uh, to Maduro the way Alex Saab is? Uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think that the ICC is, is, uh, I mean, it's wonderful that they are recognizing the crimes against humanity of what has been perpetrated against the Venezuelan people the extrajudicial killings, the weaponization of access to food and medicine, et cetera, which qualify almost as a, as a sort of subchapter or as a form of genocide almost. But the only problem with it is that it's really against all Venezuelans, not just, um, you know, or, or most Venezuelans. Um, so I think, I think it's very important to highlight the seriousness of what's happening. Um, and that needs to be recognized. Otherwise, what is the ICC for? What's its purpose if it can't prosecute cases like what is happening in Venezuela? The challenges, and I am by no means an ICC expert, that's a whole other branch of expertise. So I wanna be modest about the opinions I express here. Um, there, the challenges with that are A, it takes quite a long time. B, I believe that it's only been the only time that they've indicted sort of a, a seated uh, 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 head of state was Omar Bashir in Sudan. Um, and then the question is, what do you do to capture him, right? Because once you're indicted, you're supposed to capture the, the head of state and bring him to trial. The, legal, the precedent on this is poor. Uh, we don't know what it is. The, the new Karim Khan is actually a Brit. Uh, is uh, uh, by all accounts an extremely talented man of, of deep integrity um, who takes his role very seriously. So that all inspires confidence. On the flip side, it does, given the fact that your one best chance to avoid being tried uh, by the ICC is to cling to power because their record of getting you, getting you to the Hague is uh, as a sitting president is quite poor, quite frankly. Um, it does sort of incentivize the Chavismo to stay in power. So I'm very happy that it is being taken seriously, that these crimes are perpetrated against the people of Venezuela uh, are being taken seriously and highlighted. Otherwise, what is the purpose of the ICC? On a practical matter, I think it's a little more complicated. Okay. Well, I think it, uh, you know, it gets back to the issue of uh, the credibility of the regime. I think, uh, and I think Vanessa mentioned this earlier, is uh, that, that these regimes, they, they absolutely crave legitimacy, recognition, especially in the international arena. And all of these, uh, you know, the ICC, uh, the, what's going on there, um, I think meet uh, a contest these are all uh, uh, things that contest the legitimacy and credibility of the regime. And I think that we have to do everything to deny the Maduro regime what it wants on that front. What they learned obviously from their, their Cuban masters is that, uh, you know, look at the Cubans. They, 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 are, they are welcomed in basically every, they're diplomats and, and, and uh, welcomed everywhere around the world that they travel. And guess what, those pictures, are shown uh, relentlessly back to the Cuban people to demonstrate that, hey, you know, the world accepts us. You got to accept us too. You know, it, the problem's not with us, it's with you. Uh, and so Maduro's after that. He wants, oh, he craves 
uh, that sort of international recognition that he can just then broadcast back into Venezuela uh, to demonstrate that he's accepted and that Venezuelans have to accept him too. So uh, I think that anything that chips away or contests, confronts the regime in its efforts to uh, achieve in their minds that legitimacy is absolutely, uh, you know, we have to pursue. We don't have a choice. We have to meet them on that field. Thank you. Um, a reminder, uh, click the uh, uh, Q&A button, put your questions down. We have some questions here. Uh, first one from an old friend, Milton Chavez, who is one of the ranking experts on petroleum uh, in, in Venezuela and, and around uh, uh, the Western Hemisphere. Um, congrats to the panelists and the moderation of Ambassador School. Thank you. Well, <laughs> do you anticipate that in the trial process, Saab will disclose the entire network, Venezuelan, Colombian, Iranian, in order to save his skin? And, and a closely related question is, will the fact that Saab's wife is in Venezuela prevent him from disclosing the, quote, entire network, unquote? I think it's certainly, I think uh, his, his wife being in Venezuela certainly, shall we say, dissuades him from being seen to disclose the information, right? There's always two things, what you say and what you say you say. <laughs> you know, you you don't always just you know what people disclose is not always public information right so he would have whether so he has two competing impulses one one just to sing to save his skin and the other one not to sing to save his wife's skin somewhere in between he'll have to find what he says that accomplishes both goals and i'll kind of leave it at that i think we'll say Mike, uh, you know, you remember in in uh, in the height of the uh, Colombia uh, drug wars and the cracking down on the uh, the cartel heads that the biggest fear that uh, a capo had was uh, being extradited to the United States, and Colombia used that to great effect in uh, decapping a lot of these uh, drug mm -hmm. cartels. Uh, well, there's a reason for that because they know. There is no escape, um, and I think that I think that uh, Vanessa's right. I think that he'll, he's going to try and find a way to uh, give the Americans what they want. Uh, you know, avoid a uh, you know spending the rest of his life in a maximum security prison in the United States, and yet uh, at some point, uh, hopefully, can rejoin the world. Um, it may not be that he's going to uh, give them a chapter and verse and sign his name to it, but I think that the Americans know how to get the information out, and um, I think he will. Uh, you know, it is a incredible way to concentrate the mind when you think that the re the rest of your life is spending in a six by nine cell, um, and so I think that he is going to reveal. Uh, how he does it, uh, you know, will be will be behind closed doors. They may figure out a way that his fingerprints are not on it. But uh, I do think that that he's going to try and give the Yankees, the Americans, everything they want yeah. on this. The um, Milton also mentions Iranian um, uh, net part of the network. Now, uh, the question again is um, how much of uh, what um, Saab certainly knows about the Iranian connection to. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, Maduro, how much of that will he, is, does he know and will he reveal? And then I will add another question. How could that possibly affect current ne uh, uh, negotiations to return to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Iran agreement? Well, oof. first of all, there's no way of knowing what's inside, you know, Alex Saab's head. And quite frankly, it's probably a realm I want to stay out of, you know. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what's in his head, uh, but what you know, we can imagine, given how long and how deep and how uh, you, how important his relationship has been to the Maduro regime. One of the things that would be interesting, right? Uh, and this is you know pure supposition, just from you know having worked a little bit of Latin America, Middle East sort of issues in the past. 
what would be really interesting um, is if you look back at the narco-terrorist indictments of, that came out of the Cassandra uh, project, is um, you know whether any of the relationships with Iran actually present a uh, or some sort of clear and present danger to the United States. So if there, if I'm not saying that there is, but what would be remarkably interesting to the United States uh, would be if you can say, well, they're working on this and it's more than just money laundering. If there were some plot uh, to, you know, do terrorist inspired damage to the interests to the United States, either in the United States or Venezuela or Colombia or whatever, that would be, that would really be a game changer. I'm not saying, I do not know that this is the case, but Alex Saab could potentially know that. And if that were to come out, that would really change the game in terms of negotiations with the Maduro regime, negotiations on the JCPOA uh, agreement, and, uh, and also the, the willingness of the United States to do something more aggressive against the Maduro regime. So that, that, uh, that would be interesting. I think, uh, Mike, that one of the red lines, I think that the United States put down um, in the uh, previous administration, and I have no reason to believe it doesn't continue, is uh, the uh, unacceptability of weapons transfers from Iran mm -hmm to Venezuela, and that includes offensive weapons, obviously. Uh, right now, uh, Ven uh, Maduro has been playing it smart. Most of the things you see are uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, defensive uh, missile batteries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you start to see uh, an acquisition of more offensive weapons, I think that uh, that is uh, because basically, if there's another red line in uh, US-Venezuela relations, it's Colombia. Uh, the United States mm -hmm. is not going to sacrifice everything that we've accomplished in, uh, in our partnership with Colombia over the past 30 years uh, to, um, you know, uh, to, to, to Maduro, uh, basically uh, upsetting that, that equation. Now, might not have to do anything because uh, Gustavo Petro may win in Colombia uh, next year, um, but, uh, but Colombia continues to be an extremely important issue in the, in the calculus of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela. I don't know, um, you know, obviously we had a change in administrations um, and the, uh, the concerns, the, uh, the interest uh, obviously ch has changed. And in, in the Biden administration, you, we see a, a less of a willingness to continue uh, down the road of, of increasing uh, economic pressure through sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. They're kind of in a, in a okay, uh, we've, uh, we've done maximum pressure. Uh, we're going to see if this has any impact on Maduro's uh, willingness to, uh, you know, discuss in good faith uh, with the opposition uh, the future of the country. Uh, we all, I think we all know the answer to that, but um, we got to kind of go through this kabuki theater, um, which is more, more a statement about uh, Spain and what they're doing in the EU um, than about any calculation of US interests. Um, so we, we are in a kind of a different, I think the new administration is continuing to uh, uh, figure out what its Venezuela policy is going to be. Where do they want to go? Um, <clears throat> will anything in that uh, Venezuela uh, equation impact the Iran situation? I, I don't know. And, and uh, vice versa. Exactly. Um, I, I think that this administration really hasn't thought, thought it all out. Um, and they are still kind of... Uh, until then, they're gonna they're gonna ride the sanctions, but their goal is to uh, that those sanctions are gonna lead to some sort of change in the status quo, which of course they haven't, 
And whether they are, uh, again, I, I think that's kind of what we're all wait, waiting to see is if this uh, pressure campaign uh, will result in any rethinking amongst anybody in Venezuela in, in, in the regime or abroad about the, uh, uh, the continuation of this regime. Now, obviously, I think we all have our doubts uh, if, if he's made it, if Maduro has made it this far, uh, you know, th there's really little uh, more that can be done to, uh, to change their mindset. Um, and and I, I, I agree with that, but this administration has to experience it itself. Uh, here's a question from uh, Martin Schubert. Uh, a great presentation, but in the event Maduro is pushed out, who comes next? And does it solve the Venezuelan humanitarian problem? And in other words, what is the answer uh, to a, a democracy in Venezuela? And uh, you both partially answered that, but it's it's worth looking at again. I think it's complicated. There's there are rumors, not recent ones, dating back to 2017, when is basically the last time I was in Caracas. As you can imagine, I can't go back anymore. Um, but it, um, that, you know, Maduro might have a motivation to sort of not, not run in the next presidential elections in 2024. We don't know until we get there, but that doesn't mean Venezuela becomes a, a you know, a free and fair election with, uh, you know, in a democracy. If it happens that he says, you know what, I've had enough, I'm going to retire elsewhere. Uh, you know, he'll nominate either Tarek, uh, uh, Tarek Alaysami or Jorge Rodriguez or Diosdado Cabello. I mean, you'll get some other thug, um, you know, from criminal thug uh, to keep Chavismo in its place while, look, while giving it sort of the sort of veneer of uh, abiding by some minimal demo democratic process, which I hope that, would, that wouldn't just be sufficient for the EU to get all excited and say, call it a democracy. Um, so there's, there's that. So if he off ramps more or less willingly, um, pushed by you know, various practical considerations, which may include uh, the Alex Saab conviction amongst other things, or just being fed up with all the, uh, with all the plots behind him and says, you take this ball and run with it. Um, it, it won't automatically become a transition. I do think when democracy will come to Venezuela eventually. I'm not sure it'll be in 2024, if we even have that election that we're supposed to be having. Um, and will it solve the humanitarian crisis? Not really. That scenario wouldn't solve it because Venezuelans still wouldn't, the, you know, much as you have Bodegonzuela, as we call it now, you can go to these great shops that look like American shops with all of this, uh, you know, all of this food and luxury stuff and you can buy anything you want. That's not available to 98% of Venezuelans who are still starving. They're still going to leave because they still don't have electricity, water, food, rights, or anything else. So, so, um, and I think that that's how the crisis gets solved by, from the Chavismo perspective, let the unhappy and the hungry be someone else's problem. Yeah. So I, no, I, I don't think it will solve the crisis in the short term. We, what Venezuela will need eventually is leadership from the opposition that A, these are the conditions, okay? It needs to be someone who is credible in working with the military. That doesn't need, you know, that can at least speak military, speak security, understand those considerations, has a concept of forming international coalitions and working with friends and allies in things like countering transnational organized crime, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, can lead an, a, a group of people that is representative of the electorate. The, the, the people running for office need to look like the Venezuelan people including being 50% women, because women are suffering the greatest, uh, you know, the greatest horrors in Venezuela. Um, and they need to just be, be the rainbow of colors and ethnicities and backgrounds that Venezuela is. There's always been a country of immigrants. So it's, it's everyone. They, 
They look all sorts and all sorts need to be included in that. It needs to be someone who can have a very clear strategy of what can be, of what needs to be done. What are the priorities in getting the lights switched on, the electricity switched on, who you need to work with. Um, and, uh, and make that case to the Venezuelan people. You can't just say I'm running because I want the Chavistas out. Okay, great. We all want, I mean, most of us want the Chavistas out, but what are you going to do for me and show me that you have a team that is, that is credible, that is based on meritocracy, not this sort of horse trading amongst a little cabal of little parties, but really put together a slate of people who know what they're doing, love their country, look like the country and have a plan and can, can command or work with the military without which you cannot rule. So those are the conditions. Once you have a leader who can do that and with a code and not a leader with a team that can do that, Venezuela will be able to come back again and be a real country and a democracy and prosper again. So you need both things. We need both that the Chavismo needs to leave and we need the opposition to be led properly by someone who has those ethics and has those skills. Ojalá. <laughs> yeah, uh, igualmente. I, I, would, uh, I would say that, that uh, I would go back to, to one of the early points I made about you know, linking this back to the Saab discussion is that um, this effort in terms of exposing and naming and designating and indicting uh, criminals uh, within the regime uh, serves as a hedge um, against this a, uh, a future scenario where, you know, let's just speculate that Chavismo tries to reinvent itself and reconstitute itself. Um, because I think that what the opposition can do, it provides the opposition an opportunity to add to Vanessa's talking points and conditions is that, look, if you're on a list somewhere, if you're indicted, uh, if you've been accused of crimes uh, by a foreign uh, institution or government, then, you know, uh, hit the road. Uh, you have no role in, in, a, uh, in a future Venezuela. So I, I think that that sort of um, stigma uh, will help, again, as the Venezuelan people in this sort of future scenario try to put the pieces back together, as Vanessa said, in, in reconstituting a functioning economy, social services, uh, you know, the, the cleaning out the criminality, the, the, the illegal armed groups, the ELN and other criminal gangs. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be like Hercules, you know, having to clean out the Augean stables. <laughs> um, it, it's gonna be that kind of effort to uh, to restore law and order in the country. I mean, the, the devastation of, you know, the last six years is going to require at least five times that to, to get to a point where law and order and, and civil society are, are reestablished in functioning ways that can reintegrate um, into the world again. Uh, it's a it's a huge the, the the disaster that Chavismo has caused in Venezuela. I don't have to tell anybody in this audience. You all have lived it. Um, is 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 going to be enormous. Um, and you know I, I think the prescriptions that that Vanessa laid out are are extremely important. And I agree with her hundred percent about the type of leadership that needs to form. You know again you know none of us are naive. We all know what kind of odds uh, a, a, the opposition faces in, in Venezuela against the, the power of this regime to absolute, absolutely eradicate any challenges. But uh, when you, again, when you, when you review the list of options, uh, none of them are good, which is the least worst. Uh, so, so that's kind of, again, where, where I see the, the role of these uh, indictments and these designations uh, have for a, a future. Uh, this is from Francisco Salas. Excelente presentación, agradecido por su difusión. 
será posible tener del embajador José Cárdenas el enlace a su publicación uh, diaria. Um, uh, this, Francisco is asking for the link to, um, to uh, 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 Jose Cardenas' uh, uh, regular uh, uh, email. Daily publication, the email. We will send that out to you. And to be fair, I have to tell you that uh, Vanessa's book is available on, uh, on Amazon. <laughs> Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you for pushing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, do, you, do, uh, do you have any sort of last minute comments, brief comments, Jose, Vanessa? Uh, I saw a question about, I saw a question in the Q&A about, you know, restructuring debt. Um, yeah. Okay, oh, so debt restructuring is contingent upon a plan where you, where you have a proper governance and a proper economic plan. Yes, of course, the debt needs to be restructured. And I think that change does come to Venezuela, basically through negotiating with China, with Russia, with Iran. And unfortunately, Venezuela will have to become a board on a, you know, a square on a broader chessboard uh, by, you know, in a broader negotiation by larger geopolitical powers. Unfortunately, that's what it's going to take. And then once you have that, then you can start and you then you have a proper governance and economic plan, you can start to restructure the debt. Yes, of course, it's going to happen, but expect a haircut and sit tight. <laughs> and I don't think it's going to be the oil industry that much anymore. Natural gas, perhaps, and other things, but Venezuelan yeah. oil. Yeah, and to Martin Sugar on that question, I mean, I, I guess, uh, Michael, we should have like a like a broader discussion, like a panel on the restructuring at the due time on Venezuela. And thanks, Vanessa, for adding your comments on that. I mean, we'll, it's, a, it's a very broad concept. And come, I mean, we'll definitely have people interested in finding out what's going on, what's going to happen with that as well. So some closing remarks. I don't know if we can go into closing. Vanessa, you want, want to say something, Vanessa? No, uh, I think I'm, I'd rather cede my time to Jose. I think that. Uh, I think that uh, my closing remark would be keep in mind the criminality of the Maduro regime, don't be fooled. Uh, and, you know, hopefully the opposition will form a credible slate with people who with, with merit and make the case to the Venezuelan people when the time comes. And thank you for having me on. Jose. Yeah, uh, also, uh, please uh, add my thanks and, and gratitude uh, to be here discussing. I know that it's, uh, it's very easy. Uh, to be pessimistic, it's very easy to want to uh, basically give up, but um, but we can't. I mean, yo soy colombiano. My, my parents uh, uh, came to the U.S. from Colombia, and yet I uh, I won't give up this fight from my little perch here in Washington. I think that uh, that we have to keep at it. Um, there, there's no choice. We can never ever uh, find a way to accommodate, or uh, however reluctantly. Uh, with these sorts of uh, this sort of criminal this criminality, uh, this is you know obviously the dark side of human nature um, uh, coming to the fore, um, and unfortunately has landed in Caracas, um, and and it is up to all of us, anybody who cares about democracy, about freedom, about individual choice, uh, willing you know uh, the, the things we all enjoy here in the United States, is that you know those of us who are fortunate enough to be here have to keep fighting uh, and, and never give the regime an inch, make them fight for everything. Um, and in terms of international credibility, in terms of uh, you know, trying to uh, evade sanctions, uh, in, in terms of trying to uh, manipulate public opinion in the United States, it, it, it just has to be contested over and over again. And only by that way, Will we ever, uh, you know, create those opportunities for real and lasting change in Venezuela? Thank you, Jose, Vanessa. Um, now back to uh, Carlos Ivan. Yeah, thank you, Jose. Thank you, Vanessa. I mean, again, Vanessa, for uh, uh, coming with us in one of these panels. Jose, uh, good to hear from you. It looks like it's one of the first chapters or first episodes in one of a long series on Venice, on on Alex App. We all hope that it ends up in a in a in a good ending for the Venezuelan people. So we'll be uh, watching and, and of course, we'll be uh, talking to you in the future about it and, and how it, this ends up. Uh, thank you, Michael, as, as well, as always. Uh, and thanks for everybody attending. Uh, and as well for our hardworking team at the association, uh, Lina, Linda Calvet, uh, Laurie Dominguez, and Ivan Perea, who made this uh, panel possible. 
uh, Vows uh, has plans for more programs like this. So we'll keep you posted about them uh, as always. If you're not already a member of our association, please, uh, an interest in joining, please feel free to contact us uh, via uh, today's invitation. Finally, on December 15, our partner, the Venezuelan American Endowment for the Arts, will be hosting this traditional gala at the Lincoln Center. It's a very good gala. Invitations were emailed last week. We hope to see you there. Uh, and thank you again all for participating today. We look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Gracias. Muy amable. Gracias. Yeah.